Okay, thank you. Yes, it was very embarrassing at NYU trying to teach linear systems theory to Jeff <laughs> and Misha, <laughs> two of the world's experts in this subject. <laughs> but the other students needed it. <laughs> so um, I've uh, had to upgrade my computer through a couple of software upgrades recently, and none of the demos on my computer work. So I've borrowed uh, Peng Sun's uh, postdoc's uh, computer. I'm going to to avoid switching in the middle of the talk, I'm going to do a demo first, just one demo uh, that we finally got working on, on his, and uh, then go into a regular talk. Okay, so uh, this is a rapid. This is an attention experiment, and the aim is to detect the letter C, and then as soon as you detect the letter C, to switch your attention from the stream that has num uh, letters in it, and report the first number that you see. Uh, but since we're short of uh, programs, and we only got one working, <laughs> this is going to ask you for four numbers, which comes later. You know, after you succeed in reporting one number, we ask you to report the four consecutive ones. So the first display will be very slow. And this is a, an attention experiment for a spatial movement of attention. And normally, the subjects do it with their eyes fixed. You may not be able to do it. So you would keep your eyes focused on the numeral stream, if you can. And then you don't have to actually move attention. Or you could focus on the letters the stream and move your attention to the neural screen. Either way, but your either your attention and eye movements move or just attention move. It turns out they both give the same data <laughs> for whatever reason. So um, I have to type four numerals in here. I didn't see them. But uh, as soon as you see the C, report four numerals. OK. And then I hit the return, and that's supposed to work. OK. So this is going very slow, so you can't miss. Eight, zero, five, four. OK. <laughs> that is really slow, okay? So we can do that. <laughs> okay, so now this is a demo. Now I'm going to try to speed it up a little bit. And uh, let's see, I got to change this number here. And then I got to go on this screen. Uh, okay. Yeah, and you could quit that first. Okay. Oh, oh it's, okay. That's good. We got it. We got it. <laughs> got it. Control. Go there. Yeah. Okay. Command dot. Yep. Okay. All right, wait a minute. <coughs> okay, so let's kill that. Are you going to kill MATLAB yeah, and start yeah. it all over again? Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's not responding. Well, this is life with computers. Yeah. Force quit. Okay, there we go. Okay, so let's run it again. Because you, you got to quit the previous experiment. Okay, we'll try it all over again. And, okay. Okay, so let's do this. Yeah, let's go to desk. No, that's, I just, I can do that. No, let's get rid of this. Okay. No. Okay. Let's get rid of this. Okay. Yeah, okay, change, change folder. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is that too fast? Oh, I try a little something a little slower then. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. And I should just, this should just work, All right? Okay, I got some numbers. It's a little slower. Six nine seven three. Okay, let's see how we're doing here. Well, <laughs> you're beginning to see the problem. <laughs> well, let's try another trial. Six 
0.75110. I don't know. I didn't make up a number here. OK. So you're getting the idea that you're not able to get the simultaneous number. And this is slow compared to what practice subjects do. Let me do one more. Yeah, I see a nine. Two one zero nine. Okay. Well, this is very good because you see the letters you're giving them are mixed up. They're not exactly in order and so on. Okay. This is the end of the demo. So, uh, Peng, you can remove and go back to work. <laughs> it's his working computer. <laughs> I request him to do this. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, you can work here. I just borrow the, the EGA. <laughs> It's actually fun to do for a while. <laughs> if, as um, Ginny said, if, if, if it's not too difficult, right? When it gets, when it gets harder, it doesn't do so well. OK, so let's see if I do this. It should act. What upgrade is Mac OS 10.9. It has a lot of problems. <laughs> <clears throat> this is not the only program <laughs> that, that didn't work on, on, on my thing. Are you okay? Yeah. Great. Yes, Peng, Peng has been exposed to this before. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I've modified my title just a little bit. So I'm not formally describing the mechanisms of attention, but just some mechanisms of visual attention. <laughs> A little more modest aim here. And uh, it involves a lot of people, and everything I've been talking about is a review. Uh, and uh, Jean Claude helped me somewhere in the middle, but I hadn't in the past given him ad adequate credit. So this is very convenient. 35 years later, <laughs> better late than never, you know. <laughs> Let's see, it's 80, yeah, it's about 35 years, something like that. OK, so, uh, and uh, today, just a few. Very simple equations, no significance tests, no Bayesian theory, entire, you, know, you, get, the, you get the idea. So what, what happened during this period? Well, here is a picture from that period. And uh, you can recognize our central figure here. Uh, this is our dean. <laughs> and this is Dick Hopenall. He also became a dean and head of a whole school at the time. And uh, this is my. 31-year-old son <laughs> at an earlier stage. And uh, this was, uh, I had gone to, um, I, when I, came, I told this to some of you, but not to all of you. Uh, I was uh, originally, I, I got my degree at uh, Harvard in psychology, and then I went to work at the Bell Labs, which no longer exists, but was a great institution for a while. And uh, then I got it. <clears throat> I had some difficulties with management at, at Bell Labs and a lot of things. And um, I ended up uh, getting a, a position at NYU at first uh, halftime when NYU got a, a Center of Excellence grant. I don't know how they got it, but they, they got uh, six positions to be filled. And uh, they gave me the first one and asked me to go find five other people along with the rest of the department. And I, I was very interested in getting a mathematical psychologist there. And Jean-Claude was the best person in the world who was uh, available to come at that time. But he was in Brussels, and I was in New York. So in those days, I used to go skiing in Europe because the dollar was so strong that you could actually ski for two weeks in Switzerland for less than in New Jersey. Uh, the reverse, I assure you. Has. <laughs> I could ski for a month in New Jersey for a day in Switzerland. <laughs> um, and uh, I arranged to go on uh, Sabina Airlines, which stops off in Brussels. And I met uh, Jean-Claude at a hotel. And I tried to persuade him to apply to NYU. Uh, and that wasn't so difficult, because at the time, he was commuting between Paris and Brussels. And that wasn't so, so pleasant. 
and NYU seemed a great thing, so I put in his application, and NYU loved him, and he came uh, right away. And we got an uh, apartment for him in the Silver Tower, this big, big apartment building, and the uh, uh, funny thing at that time, I, when he was on his recruiting visit, I took him to this little hole-in-the-wall restaurant, very pleasant though, and we had a remarkable dinner for a very low price. Then Jean-Claude went back, you know, when he was actually hired, he says, where's this little restaurant that you took me to? I explained, he says, well, I was there, <laughs> but the food wasn't so good. What he didn't realize was I'd been eating there, it was for many years, it's the first restaurant I went to as an adult, and they had a large menu, you know, 30 or 40 dishes, but only four were really good, and he didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> but we arranged to have those four. The other thing that he did was uh, I, I bought a house, a weekend house, because I found the pressure of living in the city, especially when I had been living in New Jersey at the Bell Ave, uh, too intense. And I, I needed to get away from so many people on the weekend. I got bought a house in, uh, on a lake, and the house came with a boat. This is actually taking on the boat. It's sort of a, a pontoon boat. It's like a party boat. You have a table on it and uh, everything. And uh, the, the lake actually looked like, uh, like this. Uh, oh, next, next, yep. Yeah, this is John Ross who came to visit. I couldn't get a picture of Jean-Claude. In fact, I don't know if, did you ever walk up this hill, John, Jean-Claude? I don't remember. <laughs> no. Well, this was a hill above his house. My, my house was, was uh, let's see, was right, right here. This, this little white thing is where I live. Jean-Claude got a house right about here on the bottom of this, uh, this hill right across the way. And it's amazing that an hour and 15 minutes or so from New York City, uh, you have this uh, wilderness area. Uh, it's really pleasant. Hmm? Name of the lake? Greenwood, Greenwood Lake. Lake. Greenwood Lake. Uh, there's a border between New York and New Jersey that runs right here. To the, to the right of this is New, Jer is, uh, New Jer this is New Jersey, and this is New York. <clears throat> There's a tax advantage for being in New Jersey, but I couldn't arrange it. <laughs> this was the only house that was available when I, when I was looking. Anyway, so around this time, uh, I, was, uh, I was starting to work a little more formally on attention, and I wanted to see how one could define attention. And uh, <clears throat> I had Barbara and I wrote, uh, Barbara Doja that is, wrote a chapter on strategy and optimization for a handbook. It turned out we should have published this as a book. That we had 300, it would have been 300 pages. We had 105 figures <laughs> and figure captions and you know all, all that text, but we, we never got around to it. But here is, uh, Jean-Claude helped me uh, define what a task is. I'd never thought of defining what is a task. And he, he persuaded me that a task is a triple of stimuli responses and a utility function. And that's really the critical thing. So the, <clears throat> the, the notion is that you take uh, all combinations of stimuli and responses, and you map that into the reals, and that's your utility. And uh, I would not have thought of this independently of Jean-Claude, I assure you. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the, the main thing about an attention experiment is that the only thing that ideally changes when you do a good experiment is the utility function. Everything else stays the same. And then it turns out even that is complicated. <laughs> even if other things uh, stay the same in, in stimuli. Because it turns out there are two, uh, and there's a long thing, that you can have what, what's called, con, what I call the, uh, conjoint and uh, concurrent and compound tasks. And I think uh, rather than go through all this formalism here, <laughs> which I, I know, as far as I know, nobody has ever read through these pages. <laughs> There's no evidence anyway that anybody has ever read through them. But you can describe it in a very simple way. If, if an observer tends to just one location, uh, then you can say, uh, suppose you have to observe it tends to two locations. So a target can occur anywhere in either location. Uh, but it's just harder if you have to tend to two locations than if you have to tend to one. Uh, now, this is a problem for an attention experiment because an ideal detector would also find it harder to attend to two locations because there's more noise uh, from the two locations than there is from one. And so uh, you can't know if there's a problem with attentional resources until you've figured out if the human is doing worse deficit than the ideal detector would have. And that's a complication. And when people write about attention, 
uh, people who are good get very clear about this. People who are not so good get very confused. <laughs> and you always have to write to them, well, maybe an ideal detector would have had the same <laughs> deficit, and you're not proving anything about human attention in that. And so the way to get around this is to switch from what this is what I call a compound task to a concurrent task, which is where you ask the observer always to report on both locations anyway. And to give more weight to one location, like 90% of your weight to this, and that location has a target maybe 50, uh, 90 percent of the time, and the other one has the target only 10 percent of the time, and the reward for the target is higher in that location. So you can manipulate uh, the uh, ability of the observer to allocate attention differentially to one location or another. And uh, the next thing I'm going to show you is, is a brief example of how this works to trace out what I call an attention operating characteristic. But I'm, I'm going to illustrate it with an attendance operating characteristic. So this is uh, a, an example that students can understand very easily because it deals with uh, a problem of a student attending uh, two classes. So we should start on the bottom here. So <clears throat> class A is offered from noon until 3 p.m. and then class B is offered from 3 to 5. And let's assume that if a student is in a class, uh, whatever fraction of information he gets in that class while he's in there, he's going to do correctly on a test at the, at the end of the term. And if you multiply it by you only get 70% correct, it doesn't really change anything. It's the proportion of time that he spends in the class. So if you trace out an attending operating characteristic which says there's a criterion at which the person can run from one class to the other, he can run from class A to class B, then uh, suppose, and he only changes is allowed to change once. So suppose he attends only uh, he changes classes to class B and uh, <clears throat> uh, switches immediately. So he attends only class B from the beginning. Then he gets zero on class A, but 100% on class B. If he chooses to change at 1 o'clock, he can get 30% uh, of class A. If he chooses to ch run at 2 o'clock, he gets 67% uh, of class B. And if he changes at 3 o'clock, he can get all of class A and all of class B running between them. So this is an attending operating characteristic. So it only gets interesting when the classes start to overlap somewhat. So when the classes overlap somewhat, here's class A, and now overlaps half into class B. And if you plot the same thing, you, uh, it turns out that you, you have a number of strategies that are good. One is to send 2 thirds of class A, which allows you to attend all of class B. So you get 2 thirds on A, right, and all of class B. Or you can take all of class A and get half of class B, and then you're over here. Okay? Of course, if the classes really overlap, then you're really stuck. <laughs> That's a conflict. And you can see that this is an attending operating characteristic. So now the, this, is, this is the things the observer can do, but I haven't specified the utility of this. And that's where things get interesting. Because if you want to get the highest grade point average, you can just plot the grade point average that you would reach at every point. So if you're only half in class A, if you switch and attend only one class, this is attending only class B, or if you attend only class A, you get 50%, then you can divide your time anyway. This, if you're half and half in each class, it would be on this point. So you see that the best utility, the best average score you can get is by attending uh, two thirds of class A, right? You attend that, and then all of class B. And that would give you an average of two-thirds and one, which is 83%, and you get the highest grade point average. <coughs> but if you say you want the highest passing grade, and you need the same passing grade in each class, then you can see that you can actually achieve a passing grade of 80% in both classes by changing at some intermediate point. So the optimum strategy here depends on the utility function. You can't specify in an attention experiment what the right strategy is is unless you actually specify utility. And unfortunately, in most attention experiments, people say, you know, do as fast as you can as, uh, <laughs> and as accurate as you can, which is not really a specification. You really need to put numbers on this to see if within their limitations people are uh, behaving optimally. Uh, and uh, so then I want to point out that there's a similar thing uh, where it actually occurs in lectures. This happened, actually happened in Toronto on August 25th, 1984. There's a lecture by Ulrich Neisser, 
uh, that occurred in one period of time in a lecture by myself uh, in an overlapping but not completely overlapping period of time. And these were two, two blocks. I, I didn't get the times right here, but I, I have to do that in the future. But, uh, now, it turns out, of course, that uh, Ulrich Neisse and both myself, uh, when we started lecturing, take a while to warm up, as you may have noticed here. <laughs> well, I thought I got started pretty quick, but it takes a while to warm up. And once we reach our peak, we get tired. And so that the actual transmission of information is, follows this more normal shape function, where it's at a peak in the middle and so on. And the uh, same as what's true for Ulrich Neisse and for myself is here. And so if you just graph this same graph that I had before, you get uh, this curve, which is now an attending operating characteristic. That is, if a person were to switch and run, just as I had said in the uh, classroom example, from one class to another, they would follow this curve. It's now a curve because the information is not in blocks, as it was. It, it's, it continues. You notice it has a, a resemblance to the signal operating characteristic curve, which unfortunately is plotted with a good performance on uh, signal against bad performance on noise. It puts the origin over here, which is extremely confusing for students. So I mentioned this to John Sweats, and he said, oh, that's a great idea. Should have thought of it himself. <laughs> um, you just actually should plot signal attention characteristics, uh, mirror images, so that the origin is on the lower left. And what you notice is that this classroom example uh, which actually works right in a typical lecture situation, uh, also describes signal detection theory perfectly. It's exactly the uh, signal uh, operating characteristic. And uh, <clears throat> turns out that you can do an attention. Here's an example just to prove that it's not just hypothetical. Had subjects trying to attend to stimuli. Here's one example where you had to attend to two targets among letters. There was one target in this outer perimeter. That's a, a numeral among letters. And here's another numeral among letters, but they're masked by noise to make the two tasks approximately equally difficult. And so when the uh, subject is, uh, now let, let's see which is probability correct. It doesn't say here which task is which. But if the subject is attending, I think it's the uh, uh, outside that goes up. If the subject is attending to the outside, uh, primarily he does this. If he's tending equally to both, he does that joint performance. And if he's attending primarily to the inside, he does this. And these are the control conditions where you have uh, exactly the same display, but the subject only makes one report. So what you see is that the boundaries of an attention operating characteristic here uh, are well-defined. Yeah, by giving 90% of your attention to this, you don't do any better when you give 100 attention to it. And this is an attention operating characteristic, which is an allocation of resources. And you see that Subject is doing pretty well. If he was able to perform the two tasks perfectly, as in the classroom example where the two tasks don't overlap at all, he would have arrived at this independence point. Didn't quite make it, but almost got there. <laughs> so these two tasks don't interfere very much with. It's very interesting that when you make the task difficult by putting the target in the middle as small letters and large letters, this particular subject has a lot of trouble attending to large and small items concurrently. And so there's almost no overlap. And there's one task that you can't do at all. It's not a good illustration here. But you can't attend to a, a, a numeral target on the outside and a letter target on the inside. <laughs> Those two tasks are absolutely incompatible, and you never get off uh, the main diagonal or, some, or some, something like that. So this is examples of a 10 tension operating characteristics. And the other thing I should mention about these is that um, you can't explain a, a person's response to attention instructions by saying that he attends more. <laughs> it's kind of tautological. So in talking about attention, you have to talk about processing resources and what resources is, are available for the, this kind of processing. And once you start talking about processing resources, you realize that exactly the same thing applies to uh, uh, economics. So for example, uh, you have an economy in which you can have people either doing swords, right? They're all, they're all in the army, or plowshares. They're all farmers. And you get the same attending operating characteristic from uh, uh, these two populations. That is, some people are better at soldiers <laughs> as soldiers, and they're not very good at farmers. And some people are equally good at both. 
and some people are really only good at farming, and they, it would be useless to put them in the army. <laughs> and so you get this. This is uh, what the engineers tell you you can achieve if you uh, allocate your population in certain ways. And these are utility functions. And uh, it's the nature of all these utility functions in economics to be concave upwards. And uh, this was described uh, 100 years ago by, I think, Prieto, if I remember the name. Um, the interesting thing is psychologists don't plot utility contours. They never thought about it in uh, ROC curves. And they're actually very useful. But in economics, you know, if everybody is um, a soldier and you put all your resources into soldiering, it, it might be that your neighbors are doing the same thing. And uh, then even though you conquer them, nobody has anything to eat. So you're better off to, <laughs> to have some intermediate strategy. Same way, if, if everybody's farming, you'll get a lot of food. But your neighbors may be mainly soldiers and take it all away. <laughs> so uh, that's how you get these uh, concave utility functions. It's actually better to have your resources uh, somehow hedged so that you have a few soldiers and a, and a few farmers. And then the next thing shows that you have all these, uh, uh, the same utility theory applies to, uh, well, it applies to the attendance example. It applies to signal detection theory. Uh, over here, decision theory, it also applies to economic production, and it also applies to attention. So this is uh, the resources that are available either for an attention task or for economic production or in classrooms. Uh, there's a likelihood ratio, which tells you the, how good utility is at any point on this continuum. Um, you have a criterion. Uh, you have a receiver operating or a, a performance operating characteristic in the area on the utility curve. So the psychologists found a lot of use for the utility uh, <clears throat> for the area on the ROC curve, uh, but that never hit economics at all, <laughs> and vice versa. So it's, there's some, these people have independently invented optimization theory, but there's only one optimization theory, and it works for all, all these uh, various things. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, and there's a, I can skip this, but it's very useful in, uh, for example, in psychology, just to gr graph the utility uh, contours when you have a three to one advantage for one response versus the other. Uh, it immediately tells you how your utility is going to shift dramatically <laughs> between that. And uh, there's no, you know, it's a graphically, obviously graphically. Okay, so that, that's the theory. So now, this is a sort of a formal theory. Now I want to say, uh, do some experiments and find out what are the actual resources that are used in these various tasks and how can you describe those. And so it's sort of a uh, computational architecture for visual selective attention. And that let, let's go through some principles. So you really need a, a functional architecture means that a flow chart and that simulates. We, we hope that there is a processes carried by the brain, but uh, uh, we don't know that for sure yet. Uh, and the elements are specified by equations or computer programs. And we can't really relate the functional architecture to actual brain or local computations. What we get from brain studies nowadays is places where there's a lot of activity when you're performing a certain task, but we have no idea what computation is being carried out in that activity. Oh, I haven't got to that yet. But you know, uh, I, this is a philosophical point here. You have to know what uh, <clears throat> the functional architecture to know what to look for in the brain. So it's like atomic physics. Uh, you first predict a particle and then create the circumstances that enable one to find it. So um, uh, let me just carry forward. So here are some of the principles. Uh, very important principle is uh, shunting gain control. And we had an example of that earlier today. That <clears throat> uh, what attention does, it, it, it uh, selectively controls the transmission from one stage to another. Then the next thing I'm going to point out is there's independence of different forms of attention. So there's attention to space and attendance to time, but they actually work separately and independent. And then uh, I, I won't get to do it today, I don't think. There's divided attention between different spatial areas. But I will consider discrete whether you, attention moves continuously. When you're changing resources, do you sort of move your attention <laughs> continuously, or do you just flip it as a discrete movement? And then there's an important distinction between salience and representation, which if I get to, will become more clear. What, I don't understand what it means. What's the distinction? Between salience and representation? Yes. means that I'm, I'm going to show to you 
that if you're attending to red in, in, a, in a display, an ambiguous motion display, that you perceive it in one direction. But if you're attending to green, you perceive it in the opposite direction. And that means that attending to red makes a dim red appear like a bright red in terms of its effect on motion. But attending to <coughs> something doesn't change the appearance of it. In fact, what, attending to something makes you see it more accurately. Attending to a, a pink doesn't make it appear a deep red. It makes you see the pink more accurately. So um, there's a distinction between uh, reducing the noise and increasing the accuracy of a representation and between making the representation more important, which is uh, two very distinct things that uh, neurologists have not kept clearly distinct. Because they, they said there's more activity in some area when you have attention. But it's not clear what that activity is, is signifying. Uh, and we get to that. So the way to look at attention is the neural interpretation of attention. Input stimuli goes through lots of processes, and then at some point, uh, the executive, right, the top-down control of attention says, I want you to modulate the attention between these two stages. And uh, there's also bottom-up, where something happens uh, down below that so, you know, some light flash somewhere automatically draws your attention to a location in space or something, and that's a bottom-up process. Uh, and uh, people used to argue, people used to argue, uh, in fact, I remember being involved in an argument <laughs> about that dissension wasn't making you see something more clearly, it was simply changing your decision process, and that you weren't seeing it any more clearly before or after this attention structure. And we now realize from, and this is something that we have learned from neurophysiology, but also through psychophysics, is that attention affects all stages. Uh, everything that's on top, there's a reverse fiber that goes all the way down to lateral LG and lateral geniculate. Uh, any fibers that go up in most of the brain have fibers that go down, so it's certainly involving the cortex. And uh, attention affects everything all the way down to LGN, which is the midbrain below uh, cerebral cortex. And so what we really have is that attention affecting all these things, but in particular tasks they're going to selectively reach a bottleneck at one, insofar as you design your task cleverly, you get only one bottleneck. So you involve only one attention uh, process. If, if you don't design your task properly, or if you, it's too complicated, it involves lots of things simultaneously, and you'll never figure it out, at least not at, not at this stage. So one of the things is to try to isolate the components in an attention experiment so that you're actually focusing on a particular bottleneck that you can study. And the first bottleneck that uh, we studied is the one that I gave you an example of. And it's uh, an attention reaction time, or the movement of attention. And uh, I illustrate it with this example, which I've shown numerous times. So I wonder if there's anybody here who hasn't seen this yet. <laughs> and this is um, a way to measure attention. Uh, so there's a stimulus C. As soon as that C flashes up over here, uh, there's a series of balls moving on the conveyor belt, and there's an opening here. And I want the subject, as soon as the C flashes, but not before, to reach in and pull out a ball. And the balls are numbered. So the ball that's simultaneous is numbered zero. The ball that's a tenth of a second later is numbered one, <laughs> and so on. And the ball that's a half a second later is numbered five, and so on. So you reach out, and you tell me the number on the ball, and I know your reaction time. But I don't know your reaction time until two seconds later. It's an indirect measurement of your reaction time. And that was the attention grabbing response that I was illustrating here. In other words, you were looking at this stream, you were finding the C, and then you were grabbing the first numeral from the adjacent stream. It's, it's a, just an analogy to exactly that uh, same procedure. Uh, now, you have to do one thing you know, in, this, in this task here. If the subject figures out that the balls are numbered so consecutively, and he usually pulls out ball three or four if it's a good subject. And one trial he knows he was lazy and he pulled out ball number nine. Mm, you might say, hmm, <laughs> maybe I'll call it a seven. Or maybe, maybe even a six. <laughs> Just, you know, <laughs> you get the, so you don't want subjects to cheat in this task. So in fact, the balls have a random number on them and then you have a sheet that gives you the control. So you know what number it is, but the subject doesn't know. The numbers are actually random. So you can tell what ball it was, but the subject doesn't know. All he can do is report the ball. And in fact, you leave out a number on every trial. 
And the trick is the subject should never report the number that they left out, and they never do. The, the subject always picks up more, and they always tell you a number. So, um, <clears throat> so this is the task. And now, uh, if we ask the subject, oops, oh, this is MATLAB demo, yes, <laughs> which you saw ahead of time. <laughs> OK. And so if you were to just report the first numeral that you saw, uh, typically, in the experiment, when things are coming at about 9 per second, you report a, a most of the, about 50% of the time, you report the numeral in the 3 position. And about 40% of the time, you report the numeral in the 4 position. And these are the numerals that reported in, in, this, in this sequence. OK? Uh, now, if I actually, this is an attention reaction time experiment of a sort. And you notice you're getting the distribution. This is the motor reaction time in the same thing. We have the subject uh, lift his finger from a button as soon as they detect the C. So if you measure motor reaction time like this, you could measure an attention reaction time like that. And anything that you learn about a motor reaction time, you can learn about an attention reaction time. You, you get the whole distribution. The experiment is designed in such a way that the subject can't remember a, a, a stream of several past ones and look back in that. We're about to find out how, how that works, yes. You're, you're right on target here. <laughs> Just one, one slide ahead of me. <laughs> OK. So uh, to constrain data, we ask subjects to actually report four items. OK, and that's what I asked you to do originally. The, the nice thing about that is it gives you more data to analyze. It really helps. <laughs> you get four times the data. And furthermore, they're on the same trial, which makes it very useful. So when we do this at various speeds, if you go slow, if I, when you go really slow, you get a subject report the item in the plus one position. They don't get the simultaneous item, even with this. This is four hertz. Uh, and the second item, the third item, written, this is a distribution of times to the fourth time. Do you follow this, this curve? This is the zero represents the simultaneous item, and then these are successive items. And the first item the subject reports has this distribution. The second item, the subject reports this, and the third and fourth are sort of random, OK? On the right is a model that I'm going to tell you that makes these sort of similar predictions. When you speed things up, uh, things spread out. And when you go really fast, at 13 letters per second, you see that things are pretty random, <laughs> OK? But there's something else that we can do here, and that is uh, paired comparisons. What you give. Uh, I've illustrated this with. Uh, with uh, letters, but I, I shouldn't have done that. But it, it just makes it simple. Suppose I have a stream of letters, and you report the W in position 2 and the R uh, in p from position 1. We can say reporting something earlier is winning uh, uh, a contest between two, two locations. And uh, this is a, a method that's used universally in evaluating the strength of players. So. You can evaluate the strength of all chess players, even though they don't play each other, right? Uh, but they play common opponents to some extent. And uh, uh, what you derive is a, a theory that gives you the strength of every player uh, based on their two comparisons, right? The, uh, how they do against, uh, you find the best symbol of strength theory. And um, <clears throat> we can do the same here. We say that reporting a letter earlier in, or a number earlier in response means that it's stronger. It wins the contest against the number that's reported later. And so we can compare any two numbers according to where they, which numbers they beat in the response. Now, an interesting thing about the response is that the numbers in the response actually, uh, the subject, it's going to be, I'm going to demonstrate in a little bit while I'm talking about it. Subject has no knowledge of the actual order. <laughs> The subject only has a knowledge of strength. There's one knowledge about these numbers, and that's their strength. Uh, and the, there's no strength. Uh, there's no, it's not two-dimensional, where you say, I know a number very well, but I know it occurred late. <laughs> yeah? If, if all these strengths are decaying, might it be optimal sometimes to yeah. report one with a lower strength, because it's going to go away? Well, it's, a, it's symmetric here, yeah. You, know, you, could, you could try that. But the subject, at, if you went through this test, you realize that you really try to, you have four items. Uh, let's get to the model, and you'll, you'll see how it works. Um, so it turns out that it, 
if you have a, a strength model, that the strength of all items is, uh, uh, the strength, I've, it looks like there's a mistake here, but uh, have to, laminar curves. That is, if somebody's stronger, they, they, you can't have triangles here, where A is better than B, B is better than C, but C, B, C. So um, uh, this is a model for the, the strengths of the, is now a model of the strength of positions. So um, if you look at this uh, slow rate, 4.6 hertz, you see number one is, has the strongest strength. It's reported first, and these are the data. And that, except for this uh, little loop here, pretty well. Item number two is reported second as the next highest strength. Number three is third, and then four, five, and zero. Okay. Now when you speed things up, it's now the number three item that has the highest strength. And what you see is that these are pretty laminar. So you're reporting uh, three, uh, uh, and then two, and then four, and six. And it's uh, sort of symmetrical. And when you get really fast, it's the number five item <laughs> that has the highest strength. So you get these curves, and these are from the models. What I want to get to is the model here. So this tells you the relative strength of every position. And that's, I have two independent measures. This needs a pair of, of responses to get, and the other one just took a single response to get. OK, so how, how does the model go? And it's, a, it's, it's the universal attention model. All attention models are of this form. They just relabel the coordinates, right? Because there's a through stream, and there's a gate, attention, which de determines what gets through the stream. In this case, what gets through the stream is a window. So what happens when attention, when you detect the C, or whatever the Q is, uh, after a certain delay, it takes to interpret the cue. Then you open a window, which I just uh, use a single parameter here. This is a, a second order gamma function. So it has a, some time constant uh, alpha. And that window opens. And everything that opens the window that is, uh, occurs while the window is open goes through the gate. So if it's uh, a fast stream, here's an example where item 5 gets, gets through the stream at this point. If it's a slower stream, you see that uh, item one is right in the middle of where this is. So the way to think about this is like a Compure Rapid Shutter in the, old, in the old days. Compure Rapid Shutter was a shutter on cameras that opened up like this and then closed. And so it had a, a, a curve that described uh, the amount of light coming into the camera as a function of time, very much like this curve. And the contrast of the image on your negative, and negatives is what people used in those days, <laughs> uh, was proportional to the amount of light that uh, struck the film. And so what we have here is essentially a model that says the subject takes a photograph with his Compu Rapid uh, brain shutter uh, and then reports the letters in order of their contrast. And um, that then. Uh, so, so the letters are coming in, they're reported in order of their contrast. Uh, there's a certain amount of random noise that's added, because even if the contrast of two letters is very similar, uh, it requires a certain difference before you reliably report one letter in front of the other. And that's determined by internal noise. Uh, and so there's really th only three parameters in this model. One is the co time constant of this gate. One is the interpretation time for the Q, which will depend on how distinctive the cue is among the other characters. And the third constant is the amount of noise. Okay? That's a very simple model of attention. And uh, these are the three parameters. And then you, the, the algorithm is simply you report the thing that has the highest strength in that order. And we've done through a number of tests to show the subject has actually no, there's no knowledge of position other than this uh, strength. Um, and it turns out that from this simple model, you predict uh, uh, these 212 data points. <laughs> uh, you have uh, all, all these predictions of uh, what the subject reports at various rates, and all these comparisons of a uh, couple of estimated parameters. So this is a very efficient uh, prediction. Uh, it's, it's not perfect. It's, uh, I think you get 80% of the variance, 88% of the variance. But the, what I like is that it really captures the essence of what you're getting at here gives you a very good overall all picture of this. Uh, so i just do one more thing on this model, is that uh, you can actually sort of describe visual attention uh, forever. You say these are all the stimuli that the subject was attending to, 
and for each, each period of time, there's a certain amount of attention. And you can just write an equation which goes from minus infinity, uh, minus oh, to your birth, to plus, <laughs> to your death, has all these attention things. And how, how is an attention function formed? Well, it's actually, this, this brief opening is formed by a com combination of three things. First, you're attending to the cue. So, uh, oops. So, uh, <clears throat> I tell you that a cue is, at the start of trial, look for the cue, which is the letter C. So now you're in the state of looking for the letter C. At some point, the Q arrives. And it takes a little while for you to interpret the C. And then you stop attending to the C, because now you have to do whatever the C tells you to do, which is move to the right, move your attention to the right, and open the gate on the right. And you do that. So now you open the attention gate. But if you left the gate open too long, each new item overwrites the last item. <laughs> And you'd be stuck. You wouldn't have the early items in there. So you close it as quickly as you can. And so you close the gate. And so what you end up is with this funny shape attention function. But it's really the conjunction of three consecutive attention states that are initiated. Just as when you're talking, you have three consecutive phonemes. You never actually utter any phoneme perfectly because it's always cut off <laughs> by the next one that, that you're uttering. It's going to be a tremendous amount of learning. Yeah, it is. And so that perspective means a parameter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the, to some extent, people can learn during the task itself. The amount of learning, I don't really know. But you know, it, you're getting me off on the sidetrack here, which, I, which is very interesting. On, on uh, attention tests, uh, on, uh, not attention, on IQ tests and other tests, people used to use a digit span test. So they read you digits one at a time for once, uh, one digit per second. And then they ask you after a certain length, you know, five, seven, nine, eleven, to report the digits back. Or they ask you to report them back in reverse order. So reporting back in forward order, most people can do around seven, nine, something like that. You know, it, it's really not a very good test of intelligence. It doesn't correlate with other, other measures. But it's very diagnostic if you have brain injuries <laughs> of various kinds. Uh, uh, what do you think the world record is for a forward digit span? Can I have a guess from somebody? It's over 350. <laughs> and, and the real contestants are all over 200. <laughs> so, uh, you know, talking about human abilities, right? <laughs> what subjects have accomplished in my, in my task and what they might accomplish. You know, I pick up a violin and say, you know, make a sound out of this. Well, the sound you make the first day on the violin or the first week on the violin is very different from what a genius makes when they've been practicing their whole life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, 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 that's right. They, they, obviously, they got to have a very sophisticated mnemonic system. But I'm just pointing out that you know the limits here. <laughs> I, we have no idea. What, I have no idea what the limits are. I, I've never, <laughs> I've never tested. You know, a genius perceptionist. <laughs> In, in a case where they devote their life to, uh, or all their spare time at any rate, to, to improving. So uh, just to reiterate, this was, uh, the limiting process here was actually memory access. It was the, the bottleneck here was opening and closing access to memory. And uh, the attention was a time interval. It was a, a moment in time that you were attending to. So, um, and, it, and this is, you know, just the, describing this model in that same, same framework. So now I want to do uh, another thing about space-time independence. And I don't know, have I gone for an hour already? No. 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 You started late. I started late. Okay. Well, obviously, it's going to be a very truncated talk. <laughs> okay. So let's, let's go through this one. This is going to be for a, a spatial location and a time interval. And uh, it's probably at the decision stage that there's the bottleneck in this task. It's a very famous task is uh, first, I mean, it's a choice reaction time, but it was first uh, introduced by uh, Posner in this particular format. And here's a variation of Posner's task. So the Posner task is that as soon as a light flashes, you press a key. And it's a go, no, talk, go, no go task, right? There's uh, <clears throat> uh, there are, uh, trials in which the light flashes, and occasionally there's a blank. Now, there's a, the variation on this task that was done by three of his uh, graduate students and postdocs, uh, Shulman, Remington, and McLean. Uh, and I'm, 
we analyzed this task, this is Eric Feigselgarten and myself, because we had done an experiment that came out with very contradictory results to what they claimed. So we had to analyze it to see how, this, <laughs> how could this be. <laughs> and uh, so the way the Posner task works is there's an arrow that points to a particular location. It points left here. And the probability of occurrence of the light in this uh, experiment is 0.7 at this location and only 0.1 in the other location. So the notion is that you'll be very fast if the light occurs here, but if the light occurs on the opposite side, you'll be slower than if there's a neutral stimulus here, just a bar without any point. And uh, that would be a cost if you were slower here, and it would be a benefit if you were faster over here. And then you have the com comparable one that's symmetrically opposite. And in the data, I'm going to combine these because there's perfect symmetry between the left and the right arrows. So let me illustrate some tasks. So here's a bar. And then the stimulus comes up, and it's in the far location. So that's the perfect stimulus. That's the one that's 0.7 of the time. Here's an arrow, and it comes up, ah, not all the way, but it's on the way. You're moving attention in that direction. It's in the right direction. So you should be good, but if you already got, well, you might even be better there, but depending on how attention moves. And then if the arrow points this way, but the stimulus comes on the other side, ah, there's a cost. You moved your attention the wrong way. When I say moved your attention, you see, I'm already talking in these tautological terms. Because <laughs> you may have turned on some processing resources there, but you don't move your attention to account for attention. <laughs> and so this would be at the highest cost. So how do the data actually look? Well, they look like this. I'm just graphing the actual reaction time from the data. This is the actual data from the experiment. And these are the four conditions. So let's start with the, this condition. Uh, the condition that actually had the fastest reaction time, and this is as a function of the four period. Notice that if the arrow comes only 50 seconds before the light, all conditions are equal. You don't have a time to interpret that arrow and relative to light. But by the time you get to 350 milliseconds, you're actually doing pretty well. So at 350 milliseconds, you're actually the fastest at the intermediate location. And at the 0.7 location, you're a little bit slower. So Posner and Mc, uh, Remington, not Posner, uh, Rem Shulman, Remington, and McLean in Posner's lab said that you were moving attention continuously, but you never got to the far point. <laughs> By the time the experiment was over, you still had only got halfway there. That was their interpretation of these results. And therefore, attention moves continuously in space. Yeah. Yeah, you could you could look you could you could measure eye fixation. Usually, eye fixation doesn't matter in in these experiments because it turns out attention and eyes move at about the same rate, which is not a coincidence, right? <laughs> um, but it, uh, you can you can use uh, eye eye fixation measures and discard trials. You know, where subjects move their eyes, it doesn't uh, it doesn't change data as far as I'm aware. In, in this procedure, if it's an acuity task, it'll make a big difference. But when you have a bright flash, it, it's not going to affect things. Uh, so, so this is Posner and McLean's, uh, I, I keep calling it Posner, it says Shulman, Remington, and McLean's interpretation that tension only got partway there, and this is their interpretation of the results. So let me just point out two models of attention. So here's uh, attention is a motion model, right? You're moving attention here, and it continuously goes there, and then it ends up there. And this is attention uh, like this, where it's in one place, and then it turns on elsewhere. That would be sort of a discrete model. And I actually know about these because my daughter has a small dance company in New York, and we use the spotlight model for attention is actually a perfect model <laughs> for what happens in a, in a dance performance. So in a dance performance, you have an analog model, right? You have a, somebody who follows the, the, the actual performers with a spotlight. Uh, it turns out that's very rare. <laughs> very few people have that. And it's very rare to have an orchestra also, right? Most people use recorded music. <laughs> and uh, most people actually use a different system. They have a series of lights that are pointed at different places. And there's a program, a punch card program, actually turns these lights on at the right places. And so there's a rehearsal period, just as there is in the attention task. 
in which you learn where you're supposed to be standing at this particular time when the light goes on. So the light comes on, and the light is on over here, and you're standing here. You just casually move us so that's supposed to happen. <laughs> you were there close, but not exact, exactly right. But this is uh, sort of the discrete model. Now, notice that in this discrete model, uh, where the light is pointing has nothing to do with uh, how long it takes for that light to turn on. So uh, the shift of, of in the spotlight model is totally independent of, of the, the distance covered. And that's, in fact, the result that we got from another experiment I'm not telling you about. So uh, this is the spot, spotlight model. And uh, that would produce this kind, these kind of data. And you know, the lights uh, have uh, a lot of current and uh, very thick filaments. So they don't turn off right away, right? They sort of fade out. <laughs> and the new one was intended to go on simultaneously, but it's only starting up and it works like that. So that's the spotlight model. Now it turns out if you look at, uh, at the data from uh, this experiment, you actually assume there are two attention functions. One function turns on as a function of time, like this, uh, from the warning cue, and the other one turns on as a function of space, like that. And if you have these two independent functions, you generate uh, these theoretical data, which are very, very similar to the actual data. But there's actually a better way to look at it than this. And that is just to plot the data as an improvement over your in your reaction time. And if you plot the improvement in reaction time as a function of the spatial location and as a function of the temporal interval, if you make this 3D graph of the data, you see something that's quite astounding. You see that the ridges on the data are parallel to the axes. So there's one ridge here, and there's another ridge there. And if those two ridges are parallel to the axes, then it's the product of the two functions, one at the axes. It's independence of the space and time. So if they had just plotted the data like this, they said there's no diagonal here. <laughs> Everything is exactly parallel to the axes. So attention must be independent in space and in time. So that's the conclusion from this experiment, that in fact, you have space, spatial attention and temporal attention. And these two things uh, work completely independently in a particular case. And you can imagine why, because if you have all the combinations, it's very expensive. <laughs> and as soon as you start multiplying this in multi-dimensions, you realize it's hopelessly too expensive to have all the modalities of attention uh, interact. They're all going to act independently, and that's the data. So the way to think about that is in the, in the preparation for this experiment, you've developed these attentional templates. When the cue comes up, you instantiate this template, and that controls the processing one stage to the other. And now I was going to do one more thing here, but I'm going to skip through that because we're running out of time, and I, it's on motion. It's just, I, I just, say briefly, when, when you look at an ambiguous motion stimulus, and I illustrate that here. Oops, I, I do it very quickly. You have, you have motion stimuli. These are consecutive displays. So this is a, a display which has red-green grading, uh, a contrast grading, red-green contrast. And the notion is that in third order motion, oh, and I'm doing this whole presentation. Third order motion, what m moves is an area of significance called figure versus ground or in computer science, salience. So if you define a, a rectangle by uh, orientation here, by contrast here, by stereo here, and by isoluminant color here, <clears throat> you would see, if I presented those frames consecutively, a rectangle move across the screen. But there's, not, there's no correlation between uh, slant and contrast, or between contrast and stereo and so on. You can't compute those correlations. The only thing that's correlated is that this air was designated as figure. And you're computing the, de the motion of something that's designated as figure, which is high salience compared to the background, which is low salience. And third order motion is the motion of salience. And so we create the salience display in which green is salient here, because red is very dim. Contrast is salient here compared to the background. And you would see this display moving from uh, a right to left. And then if I make them equal, it becomes more ambiguous. And so we, we put a bunch of displays like this, in which this is a green display. It favors green. 
This is a neutral display, equal green and red, and this is a red favoring display. And so in the green display, you'll see motion in the green direction. In the red display, you'll see motion in the red direction. And uh, when you actually do this experiment, if you graph the red favor, the red direction from left to right, so these are the red stimuli, these are the neutral stimuli, and these are the green favorite stimuli, the subject actually judges the motion percent in the red direction about 90% without any instruction in the red direction. So that's using an ambiguous motion task to measure attention. So obviously, this is at a different level than decision making. This is at the salience field level. So now, if you, um, so this is the task. And if you now ask the subject to attend to red, you find that this subject, when he's attending to red, this neutral stimulus, or nearly neutral stimulus, is now reported in the red direction 90% of the time. If you tell him to report to green, you get this. It's now reported, uh, this red stimulus, I'm sorry, the neutral stimulus is now reported in the green direction. And there's another subject. And uh, you can actually, these curves are drawn by assuming that what <clears throat> attention does is to amplify the salience of these stimuli by a certain factor. So for this subject, whoops, let me get back to this. For this subject, red was amplified by 1.29 and green by 1.46, and this subject by that. And in each consecutive row, the subject moves twice as far from the display. When the subject moves eight times the distance, this subject can't do the task at all. Uh, but this subject can do it sort of. And all these curves are essentially derived from just this parameter and one parameter that describes acuity. So uh, this is where the salience came about. So, so I should wrap this up. Uh, so, so this was a case where we had attention to a feature, namely a color, and the uh, locus of attention was exerted at a place which we call a salience map, where you compute figure ground, and you can compute motion on that. And I got lots of other examples, zillions of them. But the, the way to look at this now is that <clears throat> the future. So here's an executive function, and it, you have a motion task, so there's a salience field. And so third order motion computes something about a salience field which operates here, and then it uh, influences some subsequent process, right? Whether how, how you're going to call the next, uh, next process. Uh, and how will a model of the future look? Well, you got to have attention to space. You have uh, attention to shape, to color, to depth, and so on. So, um, and you have time control. And uh, here we have a third order motion system. And uh, how does that work? Well, in the future, I expect you'll click on this. And when you click on that, like on a Google map, it expands and you'll see the motion processing mechanism. And if uh, in the future beyond that, you'll see this motion processing mechanism expanded into neurons, <laughs> into a neural implementation. So uh, this is uh, the way that uh, I see attention being modeled. And uh, not only attention, it turns out I was at a symposium for emotion. And it, it looks like exactly the same hardware that works for attention works for motion emotion, that it, it acts at many different levels simultaneously, and which level is most significantly affected depends on some extent the particular motion and the particular task. And uh, this is my adjustment. I've got to close on my favorite one, why you, why you have attention. Uh, so basic in, in all creatures. All creatures at locomotive have to have attention. And that is uh, you, familiar probably with the figure ground, uh, Rubin's ambiguous uh, task in which you could see a face or a vase. Well, uh, Al Seckel, who's made a terrific living writing books on illusions, uh, found this illusion uh, in an 1835 Courier and Ives print, which is Napoleon in the trees. Now, this illustrates something very important. Uh, automatic bottom-up attention uh, <clears throat> will compute uh, the, the shape of trees, but you don't compute the shape of open spaces. <laughs> you, don't, you don't know the shape of the sky, and you don't really know the shape of the thing. You automatically compute the shape of trees and ground. Now, here's the problem for all creatures that move. 
uh, they're being chased by a creature that's bigger than them and intends to eat them. <laughs> uh, they have to find out, will I fit through this hole and will the thing that's chasing me not fit through it? Now, how do you get your shape system to compute the shape of that hole? The shape system, if it's only using bottom information, <laughs> will tell you the shape of the tree. It's not going to ever tell you the shape of the hole. In order to compute the shape of the hole, you have to have an attention process that says, <laughs> this is salient. Now, please compute. <laughs> and so um, figure ground is, is really, or attention is really a, absolutely essential process uh, for, for a lot of things, not just for <coughs> attending it, uh, but for you know, using your shape computation resource to give you the shape of this hole. So I'm, I'm going to stop here with lots of uh, conclusions, but I think you've sort of figured it out that, uh, what, what's happening here. And I got lots of uh, people to thank, including Jean-Claude. He got me into this more formal thing. And here's Jean-Claude before. He was thinking about the beginning of the conference. And then when he realized this conference is now coming to an end, <laughs> <laughs> he's in a much better mood. So thank you, Jean-Claude, for arranging this. and. Uh, Look forward to uh, having another one, maybe in, uh, it took too long this time, it's 35 years. So let's, let's make the next one in five years, how about that? Every five years, we'll re or in sabbatical, maybe every eight years now that UCI has gone from the seven to the eight year plan. <laughs> Thank you. So, discussion? Well then, Let's uh, have, uh, is there wine? No. No, it's, uh, well, thank you all, and thank you, Jean-Claude.